Let's talk about piano fingerings and why, in so many cases, they are actually insufficient to lead you to fluent playing. Piano fingerings, of course, are the little numbers that go next to the notes and that indicate which of your fingers is supposed to play. So, you know, theoretically, the idea would be if you just put them all in the right place when it says to, it should lead to fluent, comfortable, accurate piano playing, but that's generally not the case, and we should talk about why. Uh, first of all, let's discuss a little bit of the history of fingerings on keyboard instruments because this has been a question that's been morphing for hundreds of years. Let's go all the way back to C.P.E. Bach, son of J.S. Bach, who begins his famous essay on the true art of playing keyboard instruments with a chapter on fingerings. I'll read quite a bit of this because it's really very, very interesting. To a large extent, the shape of an instrument determines its fingering. It would appear to be most arbitrary in the case of keyboard instruments, for the arrangement of the key is such that any one of them may be depressed by any finger. And that's true. You could play C with any one of these five, and you will be just fine. His second paragraph. For this and other reasons, the study of fingering is a treacherous path along which many have erred. For one thing, there is only one good system of keyboard fingering, and very few passages permit alternate fingerings. Again, every figure calls for its own distinctive fingering, which may require modification simply through a change of context, and the comprehensiveness of the keyboard creates an inexhaustible wealth of figures. Finally, the true method, almost a secret art, has been known and practiced by very few. So, CPE is saying that there's really one right way, and most people don't know it except presumably him, so... <laughs> a little self-promotion there. Uh, so the idea that we take into consideration differences in people's hands, in, in their physical capabilities, size, and, and so on, uh, was not really part of the, uh, of the common thought process, at least according to C.P.E. Bach, and we'll see that that changes drastically over time. Part of it would be, um, honestly, I don't, I don't know how he would say that since... It, it wasn't like they weren't teaching children um, and they weren't teaching male and female students. There had to be people of drastically different hand types running around playing keyboard instruments. So how he could say there's only one right way, I'm, I'm actually not sure. But he does say it. And he goes on. This erring is the more considerable the less one is aware of it. For at the keyboard, almost anything can be expressed even with the wrong fingering although with prodigious difficulty and awkwardness. That I truly agree with. In the case of other instruments, the slightest incorrectness of fingering is usually betrayed by the downright impossibility of performing the notes. As a result, all manner of things have been ascribed to what is believed to be the difficulty of the instrument and the compositions written for it. In other words, on the flute or the violin, if you get your fingers in the wrong order, you probably can't play at all. It will just stop. Train wreck. On the piano and other keyboard instruments, you, you can actually get the notes down with really stupid fingerings. And you can practice and repeat them enough so that your mind will remember it so it seems kind of normal. Um, and therefore, it won't feel like an emergency. And therefore, it won't get fixed. That's essentially what he's saying. Uh, so, that, I, I think that, that's quite true. And I've met many students who, are, who used really terrible technique, bad fingerings physical tension, and they had been doing it and repeating it for so long that to them it felt normal and anything else felt temporarily uncomfortable. So I, I do agree that it's kind of a treacherous thing. You can start doing things the wrong way and, get it and then get very attached to that wrong way and it's hard to get out. Next paragraph. From these remarks it can be seen that correct employment of the fingers is inseparably related to the whole art of performance true. More is lost through poor fingering than can be replaced by all conceivable artistry and good taste. I would extend that to say just bad technique generally. Um, you can't overcome bad technique by just being super musical, uh, unless you're Thelonious Monk. 
Facility itself hinges on it for experience will prove that an average performer with well-trained fingers will best the greatest musician who because of poor fingering is forced to play against his better judgment. Okay, fine. Paragraph five. Because almost every figure requires its own distinctive fingering, present-day musical thought, so radically different from that of the past, has devised a new method of execution. In other words, each trill, each turn, each scale, each arpeggio has all, you know, everything has its own fingering and you have to study and explore that. Paragraph 6. Our forefathers were more concerned with harmony than melody and played in several parts most of the time. We shall soon learn that in this style the position of each finger is immediately apparent since most passages can be expressed in only one way and are variable only to a limited degree. Consequently, they are not so treacherous as melodic passages with their far more capricious fingering. Furthermore, in earlier times the keyboard was tuned differently and not all 24 keys were available as they are now. Consequently, the variety of passages was not great. In other words, uh, he's really generalizing that in previous generations, keyboard music was more chordal, more chorale-like. And of course, in some cases that's true. There's plenty of counterexamples where it was not, including from his own family. However, we understand his point that if you're more playing in four parts, since each hand has two parts, it kind of spreads out the hand and the fingering becomes a little bit more obvious. Although I would say he's oversimplifying quite a bit. Paragraph 7. Hence today, much more than in the past, no one can hope to play well who does not use his fingers correctly. I think that has always been true. My deceased father, this is J.S. Bach, told me that in his youth he used to hear great men who employed their thumbs only when large stretches made it necessary. Because he lived at a time when a gradual but striking change in musical taste was taking place, he was obliged to devise a far more comprehensive fingering and especially to enlarge the role of the thumbs and use them as nature intended, for among other good services they must be employed chiefly in the difficult tonalities. Hereby they rose from their former uselessness to the rank of principal finger. This is extremely interesting. Um, you can find older, you know, early 17th century, 16th century manuscripts, usually teaching pieces were the only ones that had fingerings in them, where, um, let's say it's on the organ and the pedal is holding down a, a bass tone and there's a scale, let's say just a C major scale, played with four fingers of one hand and then four fingers of the other hand, okay? Five, four, three, two, two, three, four, five. Uh, I see this a lot, um, splitting scales between the hands. Uh, so I've, I've seen exactly what he's talking about. Uh, it is interesting to note, he thinks his father was living at a time of musical change. We all live at a time of musical change. Nobody ever thinks that they're in a transitional phase. Uh, everyone thinks they've arrived, and all the other ages were transitional phases, but that's not really an important point. Paragraph 8. Because this new fingering is such that everything can be played easily at, with it at the proper time, I shall expound it here. Okay, so, you know... Like, like all of us, CPE is um, prone to thinking he's got the final answer. So uh, I, I think the, the whole book is really a fascinating look at his time and um, the increasing attention, at least in his generation, to the problems of fingering at keyboard instruments. So thank you, CPE, for that. Let's remember, too, that changing of the instruments themselves necessitates changes in fingering often. If you have ever played earlier pianos, forte pianos, harpsichords, clavichords, organ, any of the earlier generation keyboard instruments, you know that the touch can be very, very light, very different. And also the size of the octave can actually be different. Um, things were not necessarily standardized. So when you get to the later 19th century, the pianos get bigger, the action gets heavier, the octave is standardized at six and a half inches. Um, some of the ways of moving physically that were taught in earlier times are not sufficient for a big monster instrument like this. So the instruments themselves have a huge effect on how we think about fingerings, as does the music. We often will find uh, 
you know, if you just read music of a certain era, after a while you get a sense of how they got around the instrument and what they thought was possible. Part of it is the range of the instrument, you know, the smaller five octave pianos of Mozart's time or the smaller harpsichords, um, or the idea that each, um, each note represented a voice, so Bach didn't really double things at the octave except in pedal tones. Um, almost never, just for the sake of pure sonority, okay? And then later people say, yeah, we can do that. You know, that, that actually will sound cool on the piano. Let's play in octaves. Let's double all the voices in chords. So the change in music has a huge effect on that. Here, for example, is a image of some music of Rachmaninoff. This is the B-flat prelude from Opus 23, and of course it's this famous roaring left-hand part that's... Um, the big octaves are giant uh, Russian Orthodox church bells, and then, you know, just the roaring is him saying, yeah, I've played the revolutionary etude and I'll, I'll, I'll raise you one. <laughs> uh, so, you know, this kind of motion was clearly inconceivable in the time of C.P.E. Bach, both how to do it physically, but also the instrument wouldn't put up with it. And here's a little image of another famous left-hand part, Scriabin Etude in C-sharp minor, opus 42, number 5, where um, uh, actually both hands are just sort of going bananas, filling in all these crazy figurations that requires a very different type of motion a type of athleticism that was, again, not conceived in earlier times. Do you know this name, Hans Martin Theopold? Uh, I, I knew his name all through my student days because he added fingerings to hundreds of Henley editions. So in the front of practically every Henley edition for piano, it will say Fingersatz von Hans Martin Theopold. And I never knew who he was, I just knew he was the guy who put those fingerings in. And so uh, he's just very influential in how people played fingerings throughout the 20th century. Um, he actually lived a really long time. He lived from 1904 to 2000, so he lived almost the entire 20th century, teaching at various institutions in Germany, and from every historical account was quite a good pianist. The reason I bring him up is because for me, Theopold illustrates the principle that what is a great fingering for one person is maybe not for another person. I always found, or often found, his fingerings to be extremely awkward and to lead me in paths of unrighteousness, you know, <laughs> to get me in a bad corner with uh, awkwardness and tension and, and so on. Uh, and yet that apparently was not the case when he played. He was known as a great technical player. And so in, in the case of Theopold, I think it really illustrates the idea that people are different and that somebody's trash is somebody else's treasure and that you have to take into account the individual qualities of the player before you talk about fingerings. I always thought he was this kind of empirical, uh, empirical, um, draconian dominating overlord who told everybody that they had to play his fingerings. But I found out Interestingly, I found out that um, when the Henley company got in touch with him to ask him to do fingerings, he initially said, oh no, you can't. They're, they're way too individual. Everyone has to figure out what's best for themselves, and mine won't necessarily be better for other people. And I guess Henley just bothered him until he agreed to do it. So I have to give Theopold a lot of credit. I, I used to say terrible things about him not knowing much about him because I had a misunderstanding of, of what he was trying to do. But now I have a lot more respect and uh, hats off to good old Hans Martin for his work. So people are different and therefore the way they move around the piano is going to be different. Next, let's take into account a very, very important aspect of piano playing and music notation. This is a diagram of a dance step. And the only information it gives to me, who is an idiot and knows nothing about dancing, is at a certain moment where my left foot should be and where my right foot should be. 
So that's part of dancing, but a lot of the other part of dancing, like what are my legs and my arms doing, and am I doing jazz hands, or am I doing the disco moves, or you know, what am I doing? That's not in this diagram. It's only showing the points, what's happening at the point where my feet contact the floor, that one point of contact. This is a metaphor for piano fingerings, because in a score, when you say play one, two, three, four, five, all you're saying is at the point where you are contacting the keyboard, it should be this finger, not that finger. But what you're not saying is what kind of motion got you there? Is it this kind of motion or is it this kind of motion? Is it, you know, what's really going on? Um, what's your shoulder doing? What's your elbow doing? What's your radius and ulna doing? Okay. Um, it doesn't tell you any of this stuff. We have to come to terms with the idea that music notation is, what is it? It's a graph of sound and time. Uh, and it tells you next to nothing about the physical motion. In other words, music scores are not instructions. They don't tell you what to do. They tell you, uh, here is a picture of the result you should get if you do it right. Okay, so fingerings don't show the motion of playing. And that is why, if you follow the fingerings, you don't get the whole picture. You don't necessarily understand how to do it. Because the whole way music notation has developed has left that out. Uh, so <laughs> it's kind of a problem because the physical motion of playing is one of the most important parts, right? So the shoe print choreography is an example of that. It shows how you contact the floor, but not all the other stuff you're supposed to be doing to make it look like a good dance. Because I could do that shoe print thing, right? I could put my feet there and get it all correct and still be incredibly awkward. Just like I can play all of Hans Mott and Theopold's fingerings and still be technically very awkward. There's more to the story that we don't have yet. And we also have to understand that fingerings reflect philosophy. They reflect the technical philosophy of their day. For example, here is an image from uh, Schumann, the symphonic etudes, and th these are Hans Martin Theopold's fingerings. Notice the idea here that as I play, that as I come down and play the octave, I play the lower note with thumb, and then I need to go over to two. And presumably I'm playing two, five, two, five, two, five, two. And then when it's time to go back up, I have to get that thumb and go back and get that. What that shows is a commitment to the idea of finger legato. that you have to stay smooth and connected all the way through a passage like this and not let go of the piano. Of course, the crazy thing is that a passage like this with these tremolando B minor chords, that's going to be pedaled. And finger legato has no effect. Finger legato is irrelevant because the pedal is keeping the dampers up, which is what finger legato is supposed to do. But there it is. And during this age, during this time, you would often hear people saying that you have to do finger legato even when it's pedaled because you can still hear the difference. That is patently false. It's demonstrably false, easily disprovable by anyone who understands logic. Okay? Yet, many great artists, otherwise excellent teachers, accomplished musicians taught this kind of thing because it was just part of the philosophy of the age. It was part of kind of a mystical belief of the age. So that's another thing to look out for, is that sometimes fingerings and other technical advice comes with some baggage of the time. And it's great if we can get beyond that and just get some pure facts, okay? Finally, fingerings are really only part of the story. The rest of the story is what's happening with the hand, arm, shoulder, the kind of motion that comprises a full technique. And so I actually teach my students, don't start with fingerings. You start with the other aspects of technique, 
most specifically grouping. That comes first. Then fingerings are often self-evident with what you have to do. So something as simple as the numbers one, two, three, four, five that are sprinkled all through our scores actually have kind of a fascinating history and a lot of uh, difficult questions to work through and they are not the whole story.